All right, so if we look at if we look at storage and you have a closet or something that you equip with one of these combination locks, what you can do is you can keep out um, unauthorized access users and children um, from being able to open the combination code and get inside that closet. And you can stash the gun either hanging on the wall, hanging on the door, in the corner of the closet, you know, however, up, up on top of the closet, whatever makes sense to you. It doesn't have to be a million dollar solution. You can keep it nice and simple, and it's a pretty fast thing. If you access that closet regularly, you know the combination, you keep the batteries charged on it, um, you keep the batteries fresh every year, you can get into the closet and get your shotgun out in a hurry. All right, so yes, you do need to think about storing the gun so that children can't get at it, but at the same time, if you put it in a safe, like you unload it and you store it um, in a real gun safe, you're never gonna get at it when you need it. I remember when I was burglarized, um, and when I say burglarized, it wasn't just a burglar looking to, to, to take a couple things. He did come in here and he watched me for a significant period of time. This was 2016 in September. He stole five handguns and then he came back a week later to continue to want to steal handguns. And at this point, um, we caught him on video and we were watching him and he would come and watch my house for about two months. Every couple of days he'd come in the middle of the night and watch the front of my house and he'd sit there and look at it. Well, I remember finally one day my dad, he'd come over to visit me and he woke me up. Um, I was feeling safe, feeling safe. And I'd been getting some sleep finally and I was sleeping with just my little handgun, um, you know, nearby and I had the shotguns and everything all locked up in the safe. And all of a sudden, it's 2.40 in the morning and my dad's waking me up. He's like, Brian, get your gun, Brian, get your gun. He's here, he's here, he's here. We look out, we crouch in the, the bedroom, we look out front of the house and across the street and there is this guy, six foot three, 28 years old, David Gerlinger. He's my, my burglar who stole a bunch of guns and he'd been watching my house for several weeks. And there he was, um, you know, watching the house, looking over here, walk over there, look through the window, walk over here, look through the window. And I'm like, I'm gonna have to kill this guy tonight. And I have my little tiny, tiny little handgun. I'm like, man, I really wish that I had left my rifle or shotgun available to me. And so this is the consequence of having a gun locked away safely, okay? So there's a balance, there's a consideration. What do you need for self-defense for your preservation? What do you need to do with your firearm to be responsible to safely store it away from unauthorized users, okay? Any questions on child safety? Teaching kids how to use it. Um, shotguns are a little bit big, a little bit difficult for young children to use. It's not something that I would teach kids how to use just yet. I would wait until puberty before you really start teaching them or taking them shooting with a shotgun. Why? They kick a lot and they're heavy. Um, no, no other reason about that. But what you can do is with younger children, you can take them to the range and have them watch you fire that and hear it, or you can put the gun in their hands and then you can fire it once to have them experience how heavy, how big, and how powerful it is, simply because we want to teach them to respect it as a very important and very deadly tool, okay? They're not good, they're not bad, but they are deserving of our respect, all right? More on this later, if you wanna ask me questions about working with children and firearms, I'm happy to do that, but that's kind of off topic. So we got our storage issue done, cruiser ready done, child safety done, um, recoil, okay? Shotguns do kick, they're more powerful, they kick more. But because the guns are bigger, you hold onto them, you put it against your body, and also because they tend to be heavier, the recoil is manageable. So the next thing you need is a little bit of technique. <coughs> when you're using a shotgun, how you use it properly, is to take your support hand, let me do it this way, take your support hand and actually push forward on your support hand. You're gonna tense this arm and lock it forward. You're gonna take the back of the gun and pull it into your body and push the front of the hand because what it does is it makes a strut. It makes a hard, stiff arm and then now you have basically a triangle and you're distributing recoil down both sides of your body. This stiff arm is gonna take some of the recoil from the front of the gun, and then, of course, the gun itself is gonna deliver the recoil into your shoulder. So if I'm shooting this on my left shoulder, the gun will punch into my left shoulder, and then if I stiff and push forward on my right shoulder, my right shoulder will equally absorb some of the recoil. This is the best uh, we can do to absorb and manage that recoil because I'm taking it into my body, I'm leaning forward into it, I'm pulling it tight against my body, and pulling my head down hard on the gun to absorb that recoil, and I'll be able to manage taking the recoil without it pushing me backwards, pushing me off balance, without knocking me over, without busting my teeth out, and I'm not gonna lose control of my gun. I'm not, it's not also gonna cause me to twist. If I, my hand is loose on my support hand, then all of the energy, 100% of the energy is going to the shoulder. It's gonna bruise me, it's gonna kick me in the face, and I'm gonna twist every single time towards that shoulder. It's gonna pull me off target. 
for self-defense purposes, we need to be on target quickly for our follow-up shots, for our second and third and fourth shots. So it's really important that you stiffen the front arm when you're practicing because that way you absorb the energy into both sides of your body. So if I take this gun and I stiffen my front arm, you notice I even grab off the top of it sometimes. I stiffen this arm and I grab it forward and I just point and press the trigger and cycle pushing forward. Under recoil, I just relax and let it cycle me. Right? So the recoil of the gun pushing me backwards is helping me to just loosen up and whip this arm to cycle the slide. Got it? I know that's really quick. It's kind of hard to explain this on YouTube, but if you want to come to a class, we can do this in person. Be happy to teach you in person. Recoil. Got it. The recoil is not as bad as people think it is. If you have good technique and proper ammunition selection, you don't need the most powerful slug. You don't need magnum buckshot in order to successfully use a gun for self-defense. Most people with a 12 gauge gun are gonna use low recoil ammunition for self-defense. Most people with a 20 gauge gun are gonna use standard ammunition for self-defense. Both are just fine and they're not gonna kick the crap out of you, okay? Let's talk about myth busting, spread. Is the shotgun gonna spread out so much it's gonna kill everybody in that general direction you don't need to aim it? Wrong, you do need to aim it. You have to aim a shotgun. The way we aim it is different though. We don't really look at the shotgun, doesn't really have sights that we aim. We need to mount the gun properly to your face, to your body, what we call a cheek weld, literally holding the gun with your face because it connects it to your dominant eye. I'm right eye dominant, so I need to connect this to my right eye and whatever I look at and whatever I point at, whatever I point at, see this finger right here, I'm pointing, I'm gonna naturally point the gun at and I'll be able to hit my target with no problems, okay? so. Hold it tight with your face. Bring it up against your shoulder pocket. Pull it into your body. Stiffen the, the support side arm. Hold it tight with your head. Did I mention hold it tight with your head? Use your dominant eye. Look at the target. Point at the target. Press the trigger. Lean forward to absorb the recoil. You're good to go. But no, it's not going to just spread out so much it's going to kill everybody in that general vicinity. You do need to aim it. You can miss with a shotgun. Across household distances, typical patterns you're going to see are like six inches. Okay? Legalities. Um, Susan did mention, well, thought shotguns were going to be easier to get compared to, she said, a gun or a rifle, right? All these are guns, pistols, revolvers, rifles, shotguns. They're all guns. They're all controlled by law, federal and state law. Shotguns are not significantly easier, particularly when we're talking about California. They're not significantly easier to get. Nowadays, I believe the law has just changed. You need to be 21 years old to buy a shotgun. You need to be 21 years old to buy a pistol or a rifle. You need to have a real ID. You need to do a background check, 10 day waiting period. You gotta pay your state taxes and federal taxes. You gotta do your dealer record of sale. You gotta do your thumbprint. Um, you gotta you know, do everything is the same. The only difference is the handgun has a restriction. You can only buy one per every 30 days if you're buying new handguns. And also handguns, you need to show two proofs of residency. Um, other than that, you know, there's really no difference significantly between rifles, shotguns, and handguns for being able to legally acquire one. Um, unless we get into the topic of building 80%, if you want to build your own, well, handguns and rifles are very easy to build your own. Shotguns, at this point, there's really no available 80% shotguns. You have to buy it the old-fashioned way from a store and do a background check. So yeah, um, I wouldn't worry about getting the shotgun because there's less legal work to get it. Um, maybe once upon a time, if you were between 18 and 21, you can get a rifle or shotgun um, where you couldn't get a handgun, but now that's really not significant. Okay, so let's move on. Legalities, we got you there. Um, the benefit of the shotgun, particularly the California assault weapon bands, is that they're very legal, right? So this is a pump action shotgun. It holds four plus one. Otherwise, I can add the extension. It holds six plus one or seven plus one. I can't remember. Um, Semi-automatic shotguns are going to be assault weapons if they fold and if they have you know big detachable magazines. I believe in California law. Don't quote me on this, guys. Do your own research. I'm giving you the general concepts, okay? But even a semi-automatic shotgun, a traditional semi-auto shotgun like this, it works just fine. And it holds seven rounds of, you know, my favorite, 15 pellet um, flight control buckshot. So, um, shooting through walls. All shotguns will go through walls on myth busting. All shotguns are lethal through walls, but the bigger the buckshot, uh, the more they're going to penetrate through barriers. The smaller the buckshot, the less likely they're going to penetrate through barriers and maintain much energy. So fours and threes, good. Um, number ones and double lots, good for outdoors, right? Indoors, I would use smaller buckshot. Outdoors, I use bigger buckshot. This requires us to talk about spread and something called flight control, right? This ammunition right here is called Federal Flight Control Buckshot. And this is a number one buckshot. If we look at the chart, a number one buckshot is a 30 caliber 
30 caliber, which is, you know, 7.62 inches in diameter, uh, millimeters in diameter, 0.3 inches in diameter per ball. And in here, there's 15 balls, 15 projectiles per round. Now, they're packaged in something very unique called flight control wad. This is a flight control wad. This is the back. This is the front. This is the side. And basically what this is, this is a Sabo. I'll let you look that up on Wikipedia if you want a Sabo Sabbat. Um, but basically what this does is this holds the whole column, the whole stack of 15 of those bullets together and then it exits the barrel and then eventually it opens up these, these fins like an air brake, like on a fighter jet. And it slows down as the pellets continue to travel. What this allows us to do is with that type of buckshot, it patterns really, really, really tight. So I'll give you an example. With this 1100, this Remington 1100, with this flight control ammunition, it puts out 15 30 caliber bullets at the same time, and I can hit a man-sized target at 100 yards with half of my pellets. Okay, we're talking six, seven, or eight pellets on a human-sized target at 100 yards with a standard 18-inch barrel smooth bore shotgun with an improved choke, okay? So that's incredible, that's amazing. That's basically giving us carbine, or even better than carbine, or even better than submachine gun type performance as far as your hit probability. So now that we talked about how wonderful flight control is, and it is very, very magical, is it useful for our home defense? And I would say it's probably not worth your effort, right? Because for our purposes, we actually want it to spread. Um, and it's not significant, uh, you know, what type of buckshot we use. Although normal buckshot will give us a little bit more spread. Um, unless you plan on shooting someone who's running away down the street at 100 yards, I really don't think it's useful. On the other hand, if you worked in law enforcement and you had nothing but a shotgun, you only had a shotgun, you did not have a rifle, now we're talking about flight control buckshot as being very important because it can give you precision that normally a shotgun uh, can't do. And it can give you collateral, minimized collateral damage. You're not hitting your partners, you're not hitting your bike.